Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, uh, the, the, the panel entitled Sustainability and Corporate Competitiveness. My name is Yoko Ishikura. I'm a professor at the Graduate Business School, ICS, of Tosubashi University in Tokyo. I would really like to uh, extend my special welcome to you because this is one of the last uh, panels for the second day. All you have is cultural soiree. And it's always very difficult after the, the very intensive session for two days. But we want to, and you might have uh, heard about the sustainability and competitiveness so many times over the past two days, which feels like two weeks. And, but uh, we want to make the, 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 the panel much more interesting and exciting and provocative. So with, uh, with me today is a distinguished group of panelists. Right next to me is uh, Dove Seidman who is a founder and chairman and CEO of RRN. Right next to um, uh, Dove is Mark Foster, Group Chief Executive, Global Markets and Management Consulting, Accentua. And right next to Mark is uh, Klaus Kleinfeld, who just came off from the, uh, the other meeting so that he could make it here. And he's a Group Chief Executive, uh, excuse me, uh, Chairman and CEO of Alcoa. And last but not least is Eckhart uh, Cordes, Chairman and CEO of Metro Group, who is one of the mentors of the annual meeting of the New Champions 2010. So the, the sustainability and corporate competitiveness. What do we mean by sustainability? We have heard so much about sustainability and we have heard so much about the competitiveness over the past two days. But uh, you, may be, you may have zillions of different definitions of sustainability and competitiveness. But what we want to do is to take a little bit different perspective on the term and the definition of sustainability. And we want to step back a little bit. And I really would like to start off with Dov Seidman, who would give us a, a new framework of thinking about the sustainability. So Dov, take it away. Thank you, Yoko. Nice to share the panel with each and every one of you, gentlemen. Um, speaking of sustainability, I actually counted there are at least 10 sessions at the World Economic Forum with sustainability in the title. So it's up to us to figure out the relationship between sustainability and economic growth, prosperity, and therefore human progress. And we need to align our thinking about what that looks like. And aligning our thinking starts by stepping back and deepening our thinking and trying to get to the essence of what sustainability is all about. Uh, raise your hand if you've been following by any chance the story uh, going on at uh, Hewlett Packard in California. Hewlett Packard. HP? HP. You know the HP way? You're probably thinking of August, right? The CEO moving on. I think the real story is not August, it's April. In April, Hewlett Packard was selected as number one amongst 200 companies for their environmental sustainability program and they got a distinguished award. In that same month, they did an internal employee survey and two thirds of HP employees declared that they would gladly leave the company and quit that day if they could find an equivalent job. <laughs> what is the relationship between the sustainability of the enterprise, the HP way, a company with a legendary, <coughs> iconic journey and tradition that is now threatened, not because of what happened in August, but because of something that happened in April at the same month that they won an award. So I think in the spirit of Davos that we reframe and we rethink and we change the title of this session, not from sustainability and competitive advantage, but competitive advantage through sustainability. In other words, sustainable competitive advantage. A hint in terms of where I'm going, I think the word sustainability is the wrong word. It should always modify something. Sustainable behavior, sustainable consumption, sustainable employee engagement. And if we think of it that way, we will, I think, start to get in touch with what it's about. But in order to think of it that way, we need to step back and think about the nature of competitive advantage itself. Because we know we're living in a new world where crisis not only happens, it happens more often than ever. What has been the nature of competitive advantage? Heretofore, it's been called too big to fail. The strategy which we start with young entrepreneurs, indeed new champions, is we tell them, how are you going to scale up your business? 
AIG's motto, and AIG did a lot of business in this part of the world, AIG's motto was the strength to be here, and they needed a bailout. Merrill Lynch's model was a tradition of trust, and they needed a bailout. Historically, we've associated sustainability, power, the ability to be here forever with size. And we asked a how much question. How many customers? How much money on the balance sheet? How much? How much? How much? Sustainability is not about how much, it's about how. How we relate to society, how we relate to our people, and how we inspire the best in them and in our customers. What is the opposite of too big to fail? What about becoming too sustainable to fail? too significant to fail, too valuable to society to fail. Relationships that are so deep because they're so sustainable that we're gonna be in this wherever we're going forever and together. And if we start to ask a different question, if a leader were to ask the simple question, what makes my relationship with my colleagues sustainable? How I treat them. What makes the relationship between a company and its customers sustainable? It can't be price, that's a commodity. It has to be something that transcends price, maybe the rich experience that is at the foundation of loyalty. And if we start to ask those questions, we will start to understand that the new realities that we are heading into have shifted competitive advantage from too big to fail to too sustainable to fail. What has been at the root of this? I see Tom Friedman in the back, so in the world, in the world I'll say the world is flat. In other words, it's connected. It's hyper-connected. In addition to being connected, and you so eloquently described that, connected means interconnected. There are four consequences of interconnection. The first is commoditization. We are not winning on product and service anymore. We can get advantages. It's important to celebrate brilliant and remarkable technological and product innovations, but whatever advantage they give us has not been sustainable, and we've lived through that. Transparency is another result of interconnectivity. In a world in which nothing stays hidden, we better act as though we have nothing to hide. In, the only, in order to act as though we have nothing to hide in a world in which nothing stays hidden, in fact, we better have nothing to hide. And we can spend a lot of time being sure that in a transparent world, we get our behaviors right. But I think the greatest single consequence of interconnectivity is that the nature of our connections is exposed. If the only reason someone works at one of your companies is what you pay them, they should leave if someone pays them more, right? If the only reason someone buys from you is price, they should switch loyalty if someone undercuts you. In a connected world, we're seeing the nature of the connections for what they are. Are we connected situationally? Are we connected sustainably? Are we doing business transactionally? Are we doing business deeply? Is this experience meaningful and rich or superficial and shallow? Everybody is in search of new glue, a new source of deep, sustainable connections in a world that has no more friction and less artificiality where the nature of the connections is exposed. And I think the next and greatest consequence of interconnectivity, which is an amoral statement, is that some amount of interconnectivity has finally led, and I say this deliberately, to moral and ethical interdependence. Moral and ethical interdependence. My problem is your problem, and your problem is my problem. Your water is a water that I will be drinking one day. David Hume, the philosopher, said the moral imagination diminishes with distance. In an interconnected world, there is no more distance. Business can no longer extract itself from society and say in the name of business, we have license to operate differently. We are part of society, interconnected, and therefore interdependent with other human beings. So I believe that the nature of competitive advantage has shifted from too big to fail to ideas, to imagination, to relationships, to connections and to behavior. Indeed, I believe we've entered the era of behavior. Now, behavior has always mattered, but it matters now more than ever and perhaps in ways it never has. Facebook is another country with 500 million citizens, and people are behaving on Facebook in ways they never have. And all behavior has to come from someplace, right? All behavior has a root, and behavior comes from one of two places, sustainable values or situational values. I can either behave in any way the situation allows, what I can and can't do based on following some rules, or I might be propelled by sustainable values. Situational thinking is here and now. Short term, I might not see you again. I'll get as much advantage as I can. Sustainable values make me think forever. They make me think about you. They literally sustain my relationship with you, 
with my customer, with society, with the environment, future generations, and my grandchildren. Sustainable values are also human values, like transparency, truth, honesty, fairness. They're the values that literally allow for deep, sustainable relationships amongst human beings in a world in which humanity is now at the center of business. And sustainable values are the only values that do double duty. They simultaneously control and supply a bulwark against crisis and bad things happening, and simultaneously propel and inspire and guide us for the long term. And business has come to understand this. Chevron is now the human energy company. Cisco is the human network. Dow is the human element. Deer is human flourishing. Ally Bank is we speak human. One company after another is holding itself out to society and saying the reason we want you to have a relationship with us is deep down we stand for something and we stand for something that transcends how we make money, our product, and our service. And we want to take these values that we've just proclaimed to you and live them in a way that will form the basis of a relationship. Now, the key lesson here, and we've seen this with BP because BP ironically was one of the first companies to declare itself as beyond. It too said that we are beyond petroleum. So what we're learning is that in this interconnected world, we cannot accomplish sustainability defined this way through our marketing department. The only way we can accomplish this is with CEOs who, as part of the culture, weave sustainable values into the DNA and fabric of the company and translate these commitments and values into corporate practices, leadership, and individual behaviors that the world can see and others can emulate. In this way, sustainability is an ethic of human behavior. It's a platform for human innovation. It's a source of relationships. And it's a strategy. It's a strategy for growth and sustainability. And when you call something a strategy, you have to have the commitment to stick with it for five, 10 years and beyond and go on that journey. Now, we're going to have a lot of discussion about the implications of sustainability redefined as sustainable something, sustainable culture. But let me just say one thing. I think the greatest single implication to sustainable values is that we are shifting from governing our countries, governing our societies, governing our companies, i.e. using carrots and sticks against rules, regulations, internal policies, and published quarterly results and annual goals to fostering culture. We should have learned this lesson in 1986 when, we, when the challenger blew out of the sky tragically. We went into NASA through the lens of governance and we said they lacked internal controls. A 500 page report said they lacked internal controls and then we put them in place. 2003, we had another great tragedy, the Columbia, and we went into NASA and we said they had all the controls, but their culture suppressed them. The idea here is to create the new windows a human operating system to see that behavior and relationships is the new killer application of the 21st century and to create a human culture that lives this behavior in every decision and every interaction. And the greatest single implication of that is that managers can do governance, but leaders need to go on a transformative journey to foster the types of cultures that are rooted in sustainable values. So I think that this conversation could potentially be enriched if we were to agree to not use the word sustainability and embrace the word sustainable and attach it to everything that we're doing as leaders to create a new source of propellant energy, the greatest human energy of all, human ideas, human inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dov. Uh, so this is a little bit of a different way of looking at the sustainability, even though uh, the sustainability has been used uh, extensively over the uh, uh, over the past two days and so forth. And as you can see, the uh, the general theme of this uh, 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 sub theme of this session is called uh, going beyond green goals. So we're not just talking about greens, and we're talking, as Dov said, we're talking about much more of an ethical and philosophical dimension of being sustainable. So I would really like to uh, uh, turn to uh, Klaus. Uh, to talk a little bit about your experience of weather and try to build on what uh, Dov said sure, in, sure. in terms of, you know, CEO or leaders uh, practicing it. Sure, be happy to. Um, let me 
make it very simple and just refer to what it means to Alcoa, because I think the word sustainability is, is a pretty new word, and therefore it means a lot of different things to different people. So uh, let me start, and, and it is multifaceted also inside of Alcoa. Let me start with the product first. I mean, we are lucky to have what we call the miracle metal. It has a lot of components. Uh, three important ones in this regard is it's lightweight, it is very strong, and it's fully recyclable. You know, 75% of all aluminum ever produced on this planet is still in use today. If you recycle aluminum, you save 95% of energy, right? So that alone is great. That what we give to our customers is lightweight and strong. If you think just of the automotive industry, a recent example here in China, we helped uh, the company Yutong, uh, very strong here in the, in the building of buses and, and trucks, to build a lightweight uh, aluminum intense bus. And guess what? This vehicle is actually saving more than 12% of weight, which equals 7% of greenhouse gas emissions, so literally gasoline uh, consumption. Same thing holds true whenever you apply aluminum in automotives. You can save about 10% weight. So that's one facet. Then we go to another facet, Alcoa's processes, Alcoa's own way how to use energy. Aluminum production is a very energy intense industry, right? Uh, we have, since 1990, basically until last year, reduced our greenhouse gas footprint by 30% on an absolute basis, 30%. At the same time, we have doubled the production. So 30% on an absolute basis, while doubling the, the production. We have set a new goal for us that in the next 10 years we are going to further bring down our greenhouse gas footprint by 43%. And uh, when we discussed that internally, we said that we want to anchor it and show also to ourselves and actually to, as in the previous argument, to our own people. Mm -hmm. Because it's an element of pride. We actually want to anchor this in our incentive system. And we started with it this year. 5% of our financial incentive this year is tied to our reduction of the greenhouse gas footprint. That's the second facet. The third facet is safety. I mean, we've said we don't want to hurt anybody who works for us. It's actually a management mistake if anybody gets hurt inside of the company. And actually, before the word sustainability was invented, uh, the Alcoans around the world would have prided themselves that we are leaders inside as well as outside of our industry and in what we call environment, health, and safety. That's what we use as a word for sustainability. And again, just to give you one example that shows that, if you work in an Alcoa facility, and obviously we have many facilities that are in pretty unruly places, you are four times safer than if you were to work in an average U.S. industrial environment. Four times safer, right? Obviously, a huge issue of, uh, of pride for us. Then let's go to communities. On the community side, we just recently opened a new mine in the middle of the Amazon, a new bauxite mine. We would have never gotten the license from the Brazilian government if, if we had not had and earned the reputation that when we do something like that, we do it in a sustainable way. So we came and said, we are not going to do this in the compound fashion. Build a compound, and uh, this is good for the, uh, the expats that work there, and around that, pretty much nothing happens. We said we will do that together with the communities. No, I'm not saying that this was an easy task, frankly. It was a very complicated task, because the most complicated thing here was to enable the communities to be basically taking care, uh, expressing their own desires and putting it into a programmatic format. Out of this came, in this place called Jeruti, this thing that the, they call ag agenda, agenda positiva. Agenda positiva is a whole development program for a society, for a number of communities, that has things in there, like building out the educational system. We help build two schools, and we help build two vocational education center. Two new hospitals were built. Actually, one is a brand new one, another one is an extension. Not for the people that we sent there, but for the communities, which was a very, very new concept. And frankly, with that came one of the first computer tomography scanners into the Amazon, connected, connected with a normal, I mean, basically 
a uh, high-speed data link via satellite, uh, so you can actually perform e-health there. And if you have some somebody being uh, hurt there, some real professional uh, outside of outside of Djibouti can do the diagnostics and help in the treatment. So all of that happened. It included things like uh, uh, better fish farming. It included things like chicken farming, as well as uh, chicken slaughterhouses. Uh, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but I tell you, it was a new experience for me as a CEO whenever I went in there to be accused that the chicken slaughterhouse was not uh, on time, uh, built, built on time, and it actually shows uh, the enormous breadth and also the fun, I think, that comes along with that when you then see those community grow. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, I would say another facet on the policy front. Obviously, this is a complicated issue. We pride ourselves that at a time when the word climate change was not only not popular, but actually a no word in the U.S., we became a founding member of the U.S. CAP. Uh, and uh, since then have been very strongly fighting for a, a carbon regulation in the U.S. Why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? Because it is directly linked to competitiveness. Directly linked to competitiveness. Competitiveness to our customers, to lightweight, strong recyclability, directly linked to getting better talent. If, we, if you ask today people that Alcoa interviews, why young people, why they actually want to join Alcoa, there is almost no one who doesn't say, I scanned the internet, I saw what you are doing, and this is a company that I feel is doing the right thing, stands for the right values, mm -hmm. I can imagine that this is the right place for me, right? And then also, then also for the sustainability part, for the, for, for the pride on your own employees, that's another factor. And another factor is winning projects. What I mentioned, winning licenses to operate. What I mentioned in, in the Amazon, same thing holds true in Iceland. We just opened a new smelter a year ago in Iceland, guess what? Why were we selected by the Icelandic government? Because the Icelandic government made a shootout and basically was looking at a company that they felt was portraying the right values. Same thing happened to us just recently, about a year ago, when we announced that we are now building one of the largest uh, aluminum systems in Saudi Arabia. They also want to go for a very sustainable development. So, in a way, I think I couldn't make a better case for us, uh, sustainability and competitiveness as really one. Thank you very much uh, with the, uh, how you are practicing what uh, Dov was talking about in, in terms of the, the, the product and the, uh, the things like that. And I, I may come back to you and ask you how the, the behaviors of the workers or sure. the people who work sort of change and how you led them to, you know, we sort of understand what kind of things you have been doing sure. and so forth. But let's, let's go into Eckhart, and if you could share with us your experience of the Metro Group, and in, particularly under the, the framework of what Dov was talking about, values and behaviors and things like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, I'm the CEO of a retail, of a retail company. Um, so we are not a manufacturing processes. Nevertheless, and that's where the, where the whole thing started, um, um, we embarked on uh, uh, greenhouse uh, reduction efforts. That was a starting point many years ago. Um, we have obviously established uh, clear targets, you know, to what extent CO2 emissions shall be reduced. Obviously. But that was started. And then subsequently, or we have developed an understanding, I think it's getting close to what you said, or uh, we have developed an understanding uh, that sustainability. That oh, sorry. Uh, that sustainability goes far beyond uh, greenhouse uh, emission targets or something. And as I said, um, the we and I get, start with an example now. Uh, establish sustainable relationships. What we do is, and again, it's just an example to start with. We establish sustainable relationship with our suppliers especially in emerging countries. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to our, say, fruit and vegetable product offering, for instance, here in this country, or in India, or in Pakistan, or in Vietnam, um, we, 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 we select our suppliers, the farmers, 
um, and we train them, we educate them. Um, in, uh, in, in India, for instance, um, the 40% uh, uh, of uh, fish, for instance, which we, or, or fresh products, I'd rather say, fresh products, uh, which we sold, um, were not good anymore once they were on the shelf. So we established cooling change. Um, we, we trained uh, people in hygiene standards for their, you know, uh, for the sheep, for, uh, stuff like that. So, um, yes, we do it in our own interest because we raise the quality standards of our product, which we sell, but at the same time, um, we, we train them. We make them better suppliers, and what comes with it is obviously a long-term uh, sustainable relationship. The same holds true for, for, uh, uh, for our HR policy. So, um, especially in, in, in Eastern European countries like Russia, uh, countries that do not provide vocational training as we have it, for instance, in Germany, um, we establish uh, trainings for our employees um, in that regard that sort of mirror image the German system um, in, uh, in, in, in regard to vocational training. Again, this is, this, it helps us because we create more qualified, higher qualified employees, but obviously uh, it, helps, it helps our employees, you know, you know, and they will end or they will become higher, higher skilled or develop higher skills. So, and again, it, it, it establishes a sustainable relationship with our employees because who we train, mm. you know, has sort of a tendency to stay with us. Mm. Um, then the, um, the, um, the, the important point I want to make is that, you know, all these, you know, uh, or, or to be, become a, or develop a sustainable approach to doing business, um, um, requires that everybody in the company knows that, if I might put it that way, the boss is behind it. Right. So that's why we established last year uh, a sustainability board uh, at Metro Group. Um, and this sustainability board is chaired by myself. Um, and all relevant functions uh, are involved. Um, just talked about suppliers. Uh, we talked about HR policy, we talked about greenhouse uh, uh, emission reduction goals. So it's a very comprehensive uh, approach we look at it. Um, and, um, you know, what we say internally is don't mix sustainability up with good corporate citizenship. That's different. Corporate, good corporate citizenship is sort of a one-time effort. I make a donation for whatever, a school or something. It's sort of a one-time thing, whereas sustainable, you know, pursuing sustainability targets or, or establishing mm -hmm. uh, such uh, policies and behaviors is a, is a long-term thing, or in other words, it must become, and in our case that is so, uh, it has become an integral part of, mm -hmm. of how we do business. Mm -hmm. I could go on with examples, but I don't want to bore you, but, you know, and we were very proud when we were picked by or selected by UNIDO. This is the United Nations uh, Development Organization uh, actually last year. Uh, they teamed up with us um, in order to carry out uh, training programs for suppliers, for farmers um, in developing countries. We started the first program with them, with UNIDO, uh, in Egypt. Um, and we are currently in adva ad advanced talks, uh, again, together with UNIDO, to do the same in India. So to cut a long story short, the most important thing is, or the two most important things is, it must become part of your business, not just an add-on. Um, and it must be fully and completely and visibly, visibly mm. supported by the CEO. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I think your, your case uh, sort of uh, reflects the, uh, the, the, the movement be, be beyond starting with the, the greenhouse and then going on to sustainable relationship with customers as well as with the, the employees. The yeah. And the, I think as, uh, as you mentioned, it's got to be a part of the integral part of the business rather than the separate part. And uh, the, the, the boss is behind it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what Dov was talking about. The leaders are the ones. Let me turn to Mark Foster. And because you have done, uh, your company has done the, the research survey of the global uh, CEOs related to this issue. And if you can share with us whether you see the result sort of reflecting what Dov and others were talking about in terms of much more expanded or broader broader view of sustainability, or it just st still stays with green goals? 
rather. Thanks. Thank you, Yoko. And I think the good news about the, uh, the survey which we conducted, which was a survey conducted for the 10th anniversary of the UN Global Compact, um, uh, and it was a survey that was of some uh, uh, 1,000 business leaders, CEOs, uh, academics, etc., including some 750 CEOs, of whom 50 were, were um, interviewed individually, including Klaus. Um, and I was <laughs> delighted to have read the interview notes but he remains entirely consistent to his interview, which is, <laughs> which is outstanding. Um, uh, but I mean, the key, the key takeaway from that discussion uh, was absolutely that this extended definition of sustainability, I mean, we may be stuck with the word dove for a while, but certainly you know, the extended definition is absolutely at the heart of what came, came out from the, uh, this study. And the study took place at a pretty interesting time. And in fact, you know, the, the part of the context of the study was to say, well, where has the, the theme of sustainability gone in a kind of post-downturn, largely actually post, you know, around post-Copenhagen world, where were business leaders in terms of uh, you know, their focus on this issue? Was, had it mm -hmm. dropped off the agenda, dropped down the agenda? Uh, where was it? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the, um, the, I mean, the really positive um, uh, news that came out from that discussion was that there was some 80% of the CEOs actually said that in a way, the downturn, the outcomes of the downturn had made the whole topic more important mm. to their business. 93% um, of them actually said that it was fundamental to their future business success and that they were, you know, the, the, the key thing now was how they embedded it deeply, deeply uh, in their organizations. Uh, they did very much uh, validate the, the, the conversations down this, this panel with regard to the expansion of the definition um, very much including areas such as uh, lab labor rights, education, uh, license to operate, uh, etc. In, in those themes. And in fact, it was interesting, 72% of them in fact had education as their top you know, expansive definition of how they felt they should be playing a part uh, in wider society, 66%, so it was climate change, and then on into, uh, into other topics such as the use of um, you know, global resources, commodities, uh, etc. And I think that to pick up specifically on, on Dove's definition, the idea of trust as an underpinning concept and really at the heart of, of, of the development of, of, of brands, of the contract with uh, employees, the relationship with customers, uh, and the broader connection to the, to the investor community uh, was something that was coming through more strongly uh, than ever. And I think that's a, a straight validation of the picture that, that came through here. And, and I think particularly, I mean, we've, we've all seen in a number of the examples you gave, talk to how the trust issue and the brand issue have become you know, really intertwined uh, with this whole area. Um, some of the other stuff that came out from, from that discussion was also though, a, a real sense of some of the challenges. So I think that the, the underlying theme was we've been talking about this for a long time. Now we're in the era of execution and action, which mm -hmm. is good. Yep. But it was also a case of saying that it's a, it's a world of, of huge complexity. Mm. And I think most of the CEOs reflected that, in fact, it's so interdependent, inter-organization inside and intra-organization, that uh, those issues of how you get the end-to-end -end processes lined up, the cross-functional connections, the, the ecosystem aligned around this was really mm -hmm. you know, one of the critical challenges that were there. Then it came down to strategic priorities. Where do I put my energy and effort? particularly the balance between short and long term, which all of us grapple with um, every day. And even now, I think particularly as we live in this sort of low growth, multi-speed world, mm. the issue about where you place long term bets versus responding to an immediate um, you know, uh, pressure is something that people are, are grappling with. And then fundamentally, they said uh, it was about behavior. Behaviors. So the, the behavior word, exactly to Dove's comment, was down in you know how do I change the behaviors in my organisation, the mindsets, the culture. Fundamentally, uh, that's a long-term journey, and it underpins this entire area. And then outside pressures they were struggling with were fundamentally, what do my customers think about this? And the customers, yes, at one level, they're sending mixed signals. They're sending mixed, they, some of them are saying, we really, really want you. Mm -hmm. We're driving you on this journey towards mm -hmm. being sustainable. And that is one of the pressures that underpins many of our, our, our organization's activities. But at the same time, the signals about how much customers are prepared to pay for that mm -hmm. are ambiguous. Um, and the investor community uh, came out, frankly, as one of the, the biggest challenges because mm -hmm. there was a strong sense from the group that, in fact, the investor community was not, in fact, recognizing or valuing sufficiently 
sustainability as a driver, mm. and so many organizations and CEOs and boards live in that world of the, of the shareholder return, mm. that that was a real challenge. So maybe I'll come on to talk in a moment about some of the, the solutions that came out from that, but, but that's just mm. a, a sense of the, of the, of the, okay. the mood of the survey. Great. Uh, thank you very much, because uh, I think the, the marks uh, result, uh, the explanation of the survey sort of uh, raises a lot of issues in the sense that, yes, the corporations are agree on the broader, broadened uh, definition of sustainability, and yet when it comes to the execution, how do we do it? And how do the, the customers react? And when we have zillions of things to do with, you know, very quickly, and in particular, how do the investors react to it? Dov, let me turn to you and sort of listening to the, the two CEOs and the, the result of the survey, do you think we are going to the sort of right direction or are we off or if so, you know, what, what do we do with it? I mean, it's, it's clear we're on a journey and like life, journeys are curvilinear. They're up and down and there's a, a lot to, to figure out. Um, maybe I can pull this together by your point, Mark, about trust being foundational. I think trust is a sustainable value. But to illustrate the distinction between governance and culture, let me ask the audience a question. We've just met right now. Please raise your hand if you think the virtue of trust lies in you for being trustworthy or in me for trusting you. Raise your hand if it's you for being trustworthy. How about me for trusting you? So here's a sustainable value and we're 50-50. According to Aristotle, it's actually me for trusting you. You see, you're just sitting there. I'm the one taking the risk. I'm giving you the power to do right by me or to let me down. And we've equated through governance trust with who's trustworthy. So we, we set up all these checks and balances. We go looking for trust. Can we trust our people? Can we trust our suppliers, et cetera? Now, raise your hand if you want progress. Keep your hand up if you believe you need to innovate to have progress. Keep your hand up if someone needs to take a risk in order to innovate to have progress. <laughs> but how are we going to have trust if you say, I trust you to innovate, but I need to go get two signatures to get $10 in order to spend <laughs> to innovate? So what's happening is here we are, we took a sustainable value, and at 30,000 feet, we all say, I'm all for trust. But we don't know how to start to give it away in our relationships in a meaningful way to get the risk and innovation and progress that we want. And why this is so difficult is think of the big ask. We are no longer asking employees for continuous improvement an inch at a time. We're asking for creative disruption, disruptive innovation, imagination, ideas, relationships. We are asking for the heightened human experience. And the only way to get that is to create cultures that are so full of trust and so replete with rules that sit on top of people. And I'll give you the best example of this. The other day I landed in Las Vegas on a Southwest Airlines flight. And the flight attendant got on the loudspeaker, living the company values, and she said, listen, we've done some research, just like you've done at Southwest Airlines, and it turns out that before you get off the plane, if you cross your seatbelts one over the other, you're gonna have luck at the tables when you're gambling. And we looked at, it, at each other and we said, we'll do it, and we did it. Turns out there's a federal regulation that says that seatbelts need to be crossed before the next plane can take off. She got us to help her do her job. It would have taken her six minutes to do it. Turns out they have a six-minute operational advantage. They turn their planes around at Southwest mm. Airlines six minutes faster than their nearest rival. Okay. It would have taken her six minutes to cross the seatbelts. They also have a brand proposition, home on time, fun, no frills, and safe. She lived that. And there is no rule in the company that says, when you land in Las Vegas, tell that joke. Mm. And when she goes to Phoenix, she's going to innovate and tell a new joke. Mm. And I think the secret here is to understand that trust is something you give away. And if we create environments so full of trust, our employees will not only stay connected, they're going to go on the journey of innovation that we're trying to inspire them on. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me, let me turn the, the, the topic around a little bit and say, well, we have a lot of new champions and global growth companies. And to the companies who are now becoming global, particularly from the emerging economies, what kind of advice is would you give, I, I'm talking to two CEOs, to make sure that their sustainable uh, advantage is through these sort of broadened concept rather than just the green goals or, uh, you know, uh, carbon footprint? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, um, 
the kind of advice. Um, I think what one has, and, and, and I don't want to be rude here, but, but um, you know, what you have to do, in my view, is to, to come up with the right measures. I mean, there's ethical standards and all that, yes. But in addition to that, you have to understand your customer's behavior and your customer's preferences. Mm -hmm. Unless you do it, in my view, you will not find the right measures. You know, there is, you know, there is a study um, that had been conducted by McKinsey for, for the retailing industry, I, I admit that. Uh, I think it's two or three years ago. And, and, and the outcome is that the, especially customers with higher education mm -hmm. would refrain from buying at a, 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 a retailer uh, that is seen as not, in that case, envir environmentally conscious or not pursuing uh, you know, sustainable policy. Mm. Um, that is so. So my, my message is, in, in, to, to some extent, don't get me wrong now, you are forced to do something, but that is obviously not enough. Mm. So you must, you, must, you must, as we just touched upon and, and, and said, you must build it into the organization. Mm. Um, I mean, um, and that would be my advice. It's twofold. You understand what you need to do in order to be competitive, mm -hmm. that's one thing, and then add to it, um, and then implement it. You know, try to get it into the DNA uh, uh, of your of your of your of your team, of your of your of your um, employees, um, and then and then it works. And, and just you know, I don't want to talk too much about Metro, but you know, just I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, we were informed by Dow Jones that we moved up in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and everybody in the company is happy. Right? They don't say, okay, I, I don't care. So th that is something that is, mm. that is, that is positively seen mm. um, in the company. And once you have reached that status, it's, you, you, you create lots of win-wins. Um, the, the company is, is making progress, the, and, right? So again, to, sh to, to sum it up, two messages, understand market requirements, customers' preferences, customers' needs, and then um, you know, do more than just that. And, 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 and sort of waterfall the message down in the company. Mm. Thank you very much. Well, if you, I mean, if the question is what would I recommend to somebody who is a startup firm in a, in a developing country, uh, I mean, I think that, uh, number one, you are blessed because you have a lot of role models that you can learn from right. and you should not give it up, right? Mm -hmm. You should look around in your industry or outside of the industry I would do both, actually, and, and learn from the good things as well as from the mistake in general. Secondly, I think it has to be, whatever you choose has to be genuine to your business and genuine to your corporate persona. And the corporate persona very often starts with a founder, you know. If it's just the PR cap, you know, looks good, you know, hey, you know, why don't we mm -hmm. spin this? People are too smart, customers are too smart, they look through this, it might work well for a month or whatever, you know, but it won't work if you build something for the long term. You know, if you, if you are in it for the long term, uh, I think you really, it really has to be genuine because the, otherwise you will not be credible and people will look through it. And there is gazillions of things really, depending on which business you're in, which industry you're in, and. Uh, I could come up with thousands of things. I mean, I just mm -hmm. saw, uh, actually, when, what do we have today, Tuesday, I saw on uh, Sunday in New York uh, uh, the folks from Dannon, and I still remember uh, th uh, their engagement with Yunus on the uh, micro, micro loan, micro credit thing, which I thought was outstanding, and to use that to build a, a, a milk industry uh, in, in places that never really had that. I mean, those are great things, you know, great things. And there are thousands of those examples around also for small companies. Mark, uh, no, I'll just, just build a little bit. I mean, I think one of the, one of the good things about um, the new champions, I mean, looking at the data that came out from the survey, was that, in fact, even more, i.e. 98% of, say, organizations in, in this region, for example, um, felt that sustainability was core to their business success. So even more, if you like, than the the general population of companies out there. So the starting point in terms of awareness, therefore, from the new leaders of, the, of this part of the world is not mm -hmm. behind. It's in, it may in some cases be ahead. I think also um, it's clear that they're going to be defining, uh, to the point about authenticity, they're going to be defining what 
this is for them mm -hmm. in their own terms and in their own rights, which is, I think, you know, frankly, also going to be incredibly creative and valuable for the whole world to understand, mm -hmm. to understand that. I think in the end of the day, the, you know, the, the kind of things that, that came out from the report, again, in terms of what people should do to kind of move on down the journey, I think are probably do still apply, and, and a couple have been touched on already, at the point about how do you make sure you're continuing to shape and understand the consumer behaviors and the markets that you operate in? That is a, that is a very fundamental piece. The second piece is to work on the, um, the skills, the mindsets, the culture of the organization. A lot of that comes down to leadership behaviors, the kind of rewards you, you give. And there are some things you can put in place and begin to think about in terms of how, as a new company, you set the tone around your operating model and your performance management approaches that are underpinning this thinking. And I think, again, back to the comments made by Dove, it's very much not about rules. It's very much about principles. Uh, it's the principles you, you set in the organization. And then the fact that they see you uh, living those principles, I think, is so key. OK, thank you very much. I would like to, since we have about 10 minutes or so, I would like to open it up to the floor. Gentleman over here. If you could uh, mention your There's name and address to whoever you're addressing the question to. And just yeah. limit it to one question, please. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Mutambara from Zimbabwe. Um, I think the message is very clear that sustainability should be part of strategy. Sustainability should be embedded in strategy, which brings us issues of how are we crafting strategy as a company, as a nation. Are we involving the customers? Are we involving the government? Are we involving the community in the development of strategy? And then on leadership, leadership is about making others leaders. In other words, the ultimate measure of leadership is making yourself irrelevant in the organization. <laughs> How are we ensuring that we are making ourselves irrelevant as CEOs? Lastly, innovation won't happen without failure. How are we building in tolerance for failure so we can motivate and encourage innovation? It sounds like a three questions, but I'll, uh, <laughs> yeah, it sounded I'll like let it. you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. anybody, yeah, I, I think I, I, I think I can make it one answer, yes, yes, and yes again, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, which I think for the first question of who do you involve, customers, and uh, yeah, you have, I think the, the more you involve, the better you're off, right? It doesn't hurt to get smarter, right? And, and to understand what are the, there will be conflicts in there. Right, and, and the world is a complex world, but it's actually better to handle complexity instead of closing your eyes. And very often the good news is you find some solutions to balance it off. And China is a beautiful example, I mean, of having found some solutions for 1.3, not for all of them, but for a lot of them, and having achieved this growth in the last 20, 30 years that we are all enjoying here. You know, so I, I would definitely involve them all. And in regards to, I mean, making yourself uh, uh, irrelevant as a leader, very ambitious goal, very <laughs> ambitious goal, I tell you. And, and, and I would also agree that not many leaders have that, you know. So uh, I think the biggest aspect uh, was coming from a lot of folks here. Uh, I think if you have an inspiring theme, the theme by itself uh, creates so much meaning for the employees that it, is, uh, it, it, it gives them inspiration. Because there are days when you are going to be frustrated. I mean, I tell you, when, when I joined Alcoa and people asked me, how can you make something relevant that's just a shiny metal? You know, I told the story of my father, who was originally an engineer and then became an aerospace engineer. And when I was probably nine years old, he came home with a little piece of something, you know, and he said, look at that, this is a metal, you know. And, uh, and he made me guess how heavy this is. And it looked heavy, you know. I had touched metal before. And then he dropped it into my hand, and I was big time surprised how light it was, right? And then he was telling me about the strength of this metal, right? For him, for him this meant the biggest inspiration that he had in his life to make people fly, right? That's what it meant to him. And when you have that inspiration, it goes a long way. Great. Thank you. Well, you said yes, yes, yes. I could also give you a one-word answer to the question. <laughs> so collaboration is a behavior. If you create a relationship rooted in sustainable values, you can collaborate. So of course, collaborate with strategy. The way to make one leader irrelevant and not needing 
a hero is to foster a culture that is producing one leader after another. See, my family can't copy your family, yours can't copy mine. We always learned in business that the source of our greatest advantage is to create something that can't be copied. Culture is the only thing the competition can't copy, yet we just let it happen. We don't get intentional and deliberate about culture and figure out what are all the levers that allow us to strengthen uh, our culture. And finally, if there's a lot of trust in the culture, people might take risk and they're going to trust that their boss is not going to think they're stupid or that if they spend $10, they're not going to get fired for that. In high trust, people take the risk because they trust that something bad's not going to happen to them for failure. All of this has to be rooted in sustainable values. And let me just add one thing. I think, Klaus, the word inspiration is the most important word in this conversation. As leaders, we have three choices. We can coerce people, my way or the highway, get me the report by 5 o'clock. We can motivate them, but carrots and sticks are commodities. Your competitors have carrots and sticks. Or we can inspire them. And to inspire someone is to go in, inspire, to speak about beliefs that they share with you, to enlist them in a vision that they think is worthy of who they are and their hard work, and to do something significant, not just successful. And I think that the most free and cheap and renewable energy is inspiration. Carrots and sticks cost you something, and inspiration is cheap, affordable, and clean, and renewable. And I think that inspirational leaders can create these cultures to create human energy. So I think it's the most important word. Great. Uh, let me take some other questions. Please. My question is, you know, everyone can say he's doing su sustainable things, but some, um, some countries are s saying one thing and doing another. So how we control when they, when they face the benefits uh, numerous from unsustainable thing, items? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think clearly, in the end of the day, the one word we've interestingly not used very much in this um, conversation so far is regulation, um, which I think is probably quite a healthy thing because many people would have started off by thinking that you know, sustainability was about how you respond to regulatory environments. Uh, and I think clearly, you know, uh, that, we're, that we, there is a lot of discussion around uh, some aspects of this, of this um, storyline that, that do sit in the world of policy and regulation uh, and the broader picture, and you can see parts of the world moving with varying degrees of pace and urgency and, and a commitment around that. I think it comes back to the, um, to me it comes back to the theme of the, uh, of the whole, whole topic here. In a way, my view, our view would be that the organizations and the countries that get this are the ones that are going to thrive in the long term. That, you know, that actually if you are getting it in terms of your broader view about how you create enterprises in your country and how they connect with the rest of the world, uh, and again, if individual enterprises, and I think at the end of the day, the thing that's been, been we've all learnt around this whole topic over the past um, uh, decade is it's businesses that actually set the agenda around this, um, not governments. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think the businesses will pick up this ball, and those that do will, will have competitive advantage, or, or in perhaps maybe to dig into the point that Dove made again earlier, we would call it you know, competitive essence. It's actually what's inside the organization uh, that in the end I think will, will be the differentiator and I think those organizations and countries that maybe don't quite get it will be a little bit slower at the party and it's a competitive world out there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Christopher Ng, I represent a global trade union. The word competitiveness is a dirty and threatening word for workers and for trade unions. This is because Without exception, in every company, in every country, unions and workers are constantly reminded that we are, in, we are an increasingly interdependent and globalised economy, and therefore we have to be competitive. I want to emphasise that workers and trade unions understood that it is necessary for them to be competitive. But it cannot be done in the simplified form as it has been going on and still continuing. What I'm referring to is the fact that employers are resorting to cost-cutting, reducing wages, preventing workers from uh, forming trade union, from collective bargaining. And, you know, when, when we speak to governments in developing countries, for example, they always tell us, you know, for us it is very simple. We are depending on FDI. 
if a multinational company comes to our country and say to me, I'm bringing in you know, $100 million, and therefore on the conditionalities that you must exempt us from all the coverage under the law. So today, you have free trade zone in practically every country. Where it's like cowboy town, you know, employers can do what they like. They can forget about you know, you know, every kind of regulation that is in place. The fact is that this is not working. Workers' wages are doing, today being suppressed. If we look at the financial crisis, we can understand very clearly it is not sustainable. Workers today do not earn enough to be good consumers. This is why you see one of the response of government to the financial crisis is through, through packages where they give back subsidies to the individual. Why? Because workers are not earning enough. And therefore, it is not sustainable. I just want to take this opportunity to emphasize that there are other ways to be competitive. There are unions that we represent which are prepared to sit down with employers to discuss you know, on the basis of how they can be more competitive through mechanism, through training and other process to increase productivity and profitability. There can be no easy way by just reducing wages. And I think this is very clear. If you look at the United States, for example, there's a, a study I, recently I? which showed that companies which have the most number of uh, retrained staff, the CEO are the ones that are earning the most salary. Okay. So I think oh, there's something just, wrong. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, just a quick example, um, addressing what you, what you said. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's the, the, the company that has to, in that regard, establish rules. What do I mean? We, we are, as a, again, a retailer. We sell trousers, blue jeans, um, many of them being manufactured in Bangladesh. Um, obviously, low wages, but, but our policy is that each and every supplier we work with you know, must be audited by us um, whether or not our requirements in respect of working conditions and payment levels are fulfilled. If not, and now, the, now comes the difficult part, if not, then we ask the supplier to improve, for instance, working conditions or increase pay, and we audit again. If in the second, after the second audit, our requirements are not fulfilled, then the supplier is either delisted or we do not start to work with them. Mm. We've talked to NGOs about it, and they said, they told me, Cordes, this is wrong. Because if you don't work then, if you, do, if, you don't, if you do not establish a working relationship with such a supplier, then things will not change. That is also true. But, I mean, what can we do if he, if he or the, the, he and that, the, the, the supplier refuses to, to fulfill our requirement? So the world is complex. But, uh, you know, I would, I would sleep better if customers would not come to our stores and want to buy jeans, you know, at a price of 8 euros or 8 dollars but they would be prepared to pay 15, but this is unfortunately not the case. Mm. So what I'm saying is you have to manage trade-offs here, and it's, mm. an, it, I mean, it's a simple example of genes. Mm. What do you do? I mean, we, I mean, I'm speaking from experience here. We have delisted suppliers, um, and then we're criticized by NGOs. So, uh, and then, well, that's the point I want to make. Okay, any questions? The lady there, please. I want to relate to the comment that the investors value sustainability as the source of competitiveness. Um, many companies nowadays publish a sustainability report and uh, disclose their environmental impacts, but I see there's disconnect with their financial statements. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's any way of converting sustainability into more tangible numbers to integrate into finan financial statements. Yeah, well, there's a big movement happening, I can assure you, and unfortunately, that's not all positive. I mean, these days you see uh, Bloomberg and Thomson, Thomson Reuters both trying to in incorporate into their regular reporting on publicly listed companies uh, sustainability measures. This is currently evolving. Uh, the first uh, s things that I have seen were rather shocking than encouraging because the validity of the data was so off. Right? I think one of the issues is that, that uh, it would help to have that. I couldn't agree more. I think the sustainability report is not a bad thing, frankly. We have one global one as well as one for China. Regions actually 
they are not they are not forced to do it, but most think that it's very very important for them, for their employees, and for their customers, and for their recruiting efforts to have something like that. But what we definitely need, I mean, to develop that further and to come to a standard set of measures, I see that in our industry in a very strange way. I mean, because we compete in in the packaging industry for against PET bottles uh, like this. Right, this and people tell me it gets recycled. Yes, it gets recycled and ends up in the in the bottom of this carpet once. That's the recycling it, it, you can do with it. Whereas when you do it in aluminum, you can recycle it forever. After 60 days, you throw it away. After 60 days, it comes back as a new can. Right, but we cannot get that currently into all sustainability measures, end-to-end -end measures. Right, that's that's a bit of a problem, and I think we all have to jointly work on it. So would encourage you to continue to push. We will too. <laughs> uh, since uh, we're running out of time, and uh, I know there are quite a bit of uh, questions uh, still, but uh, I would like to close the session. But if we can just kind of give you a little more different perspectives on sustainability and competitiveness with the session, uh, after you hear a lot of other items or the issues related to the sustainability and uh, leave you with a little bit more things to think about throughout uh, tomorrow, that'll be, we'll be very happy. Please join me to uh, give a big hands to the distinguished group of panelists and thank you very much for you. <laughs>